Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this meeting today of the Strong Community Select Committee. Um, thank you all very much for coming along, and especially to um, the members of the public that have come to speak in our public open forum. Certainly where I live, it was minus five this morning, so uh, it looks as if we've got some snow on the way today. So um, we'll, we'll all be quite happy to get home safely this afternoon. Um, the, can I ask if the, uh, I think probably the best thing to do is to introduce ourselves in a moment. Before we do that, I'd just like to draw people's attention to the microphones. Um, when you speak, if you could press the button so that it lights up red. Um, we are live streamed, and for the benefit of those people that are watching online, the, the camera will then swing to you so that you know you're visible then on on the live streaming. Can I also ask people to turn off their mobile phones? And if I could ask, um, we'll we'll do introductions. My name is uh, Councillor Jane Pratt. I represent the area of Clenethley Hill. Gilwyn and Cliddoch, and if I could move over to Councillor Murphy. Phil Murphy, Cabinet Member for Resources. Mark Howcroft, Assistant Head of Finance. Roger Hoggins, Head of Operations. Richard Williams, Democratic Services. Susie Squires, um, resident of Shy Newton. Nick Vincent, resident of Shire Newton. Linda Guppy. Oh. Peter Davis, Chief Officer for Resources. Linda Guppy, um, County Councillor, member of this committee. Uh, Councillor Richard Roden, uh, member for Dixton with Osbaston, Monmouth, and member of this committee. County Councillor Laura Jones, uh, member for Wysham, uh, member of this committee. Um, a member of this committee, and I represent Tintin and St. Albans. Um, Councillor Val Smith, Land Ward member, member of the committee. Uh, County Councillor Tony Eason, Dewstow Ward, Caldecott, member of this committee. Uh, Peter Sutherland, representing Land Community Council. Thank you. Thank, uh, thank you all very much, and uh, it's uh, good. To, we've, we've got uh, many officers here to help answer questions, and also um, uh, two portfolio um, members, Councillor Murphy and Councillor Brian Jones, who has, um, is sitting in the front row. So thank you very much for coming along today. Can I take any apologies for absence? Uh, just one apology, Chair, from Councillor Harris. Thank you very much. Uh, declarations of interest? We'll, we'll take them as and when. So if we now move on to the public open forum, uh, we're um, pleased to say that we've got uh, two members of the public that would like to speak today. So can I first of all invite um, Mr Nick Vincent to address the committee? If you'd like to, I think it's come to the front here or... Or would you like to stay where you are? I'm happy to stay where I am. Okay, fine. Um, Mr. Vincent, the floor is yours. Thank you for the opportunity to address the committee. My interest, uh, my wife's interest, uh, is in your speed management policy that's been produced by um, a working group from this committee. Um, this is a long-awaited policy. Uh, it's very disappointing that the time allowed for public um, consultation on this is far short of what was promised um, by the previous chair of this committee um, over 18 months ago, who had hoped to get it out for public consultation before the elections that took place. Um, it doesn't meet uh, the promises made by the head of operations um, to me by email back in February that he was expecting public consultations to be out within a couple of weeks of that time. And it doesn't meet what you, um, Chair, said to me in July of last year, 
that you hope to get the public consultations arranged before the um, summer recess. What we've ended up with is a speed management policy that has been um, put in as an appendix to a road safety policy, um, almost hidden, one might say there, uh, as such. It is then put out for public consultation through the area committees, where once again only 10 minutes of public speaking is allowed at that. I'm afraid this falls far short of the commitment to public consultation that was originally promised. Um, moving on from that point, uh, as I've made the point at the uh, Lower Y Area Committee and has unfortunately been widely reported in the press, which wasn't my intention as such, but these things happen, um, including the Free Press, South Wales Argus, Wales Online, all their um, online outlets, including the BBC News, that the policy that has been produced by your committee or the working group, the unknown working group, we don't know who was members of this working group, it, as usual, seems to be rather secretive, these things. Certainly no members of the public, as far as I know, were included in that, although I've, we had offered to take part in it. And our offers were apparently gratefully accepted, but never taken up. Um, that paper is, as has been said before, and I'm not going to labour on it, um, very much a direct copy of Caerphilly Borough Council's paper, produced in 2009, 10 years ago. Um, Monmouthshire says it's a, a forward-thinking, innovative authority, and I like to think that it is in some of the things I've seen, but to produce a paper that's 80% or more a copy of Caerphilly's doesn't really stand up to that billing. Um, following press reports, um, it's been reported that the paper was extensively modified. Um, I'm afraid that if you actually look at what you'll see from um, the online copies of your own paper and the Caerphilly paper, uh, I'll leave you to judge whether you think that's been extensively modified. It certainly doesn't look it to me. Um, if you can't find the Caerphilly paper, I'm sure your highways department will be able to give you the link to their online. Turning to the content of the paper, probably because um, Caerphilly is um, a borough council, it doesn't have the same impact or interest, shall we say, on rural communities. Monmouthshire, according to your local development plan, is some 97% uh, rural. The rural problems with speed are very different to urban problems. Not only are the problems different, the way that these can be measured um, are very different. It's all very fine for urban areas to have the um, go-safe camera van, um, but in urban areas, this just doesn't apply. If you imagine sort of a, a linear development um, somewhere, a village that is saying that traffic is speeding through it, the likelihood of being able to find a parking space for that camera van to be able to measure the speeds is extremely remote. There are only three real reliable methods of measuring speed. The go-safe camera van, go-safe covert measurement known as Golden River, and tubes across the road. All three of these have problems in urban areas. The van must have hard standing, must be highly visible. That's one of the, the rules that the police abide by in doing that. Therefore, traffic will slow down when they see the van. Um, people break when they, they see the van, obviously, and others flash lights and warn that the van is there, thus giving bad data from any measurement of those vans. The covert method that they use, which is to strap a, a reader, radar reader, onto a telegraph pole, requires a telegraph pole. A tree is not good enough, a lamppost is not good enough, a road sign is not good enough. It must be a telegraph pole. Likelihood of finding a telegraph pole in the right place is once again remote. So we're starting to get lower and lower in the, the levels of pure measurement that we can get. Tubes across the road are the most accurate and can be put almost anywhere. Problem with the tubes across the road is that they measure everything. They measure it from 
push bikes up to the uh, 18 wheelers that might go uh, along the road. If you then measure that uh, and average it over seven days a week across all vehicles, you get an ev inevitably a low level of uh, average mean speed. If you use that then to say, well, the traffic in your area doesn't go faster than the speed limit already, <coughs> communities are already um, fighting uh, an uphill battle to convince highways that a, that a lower speed limit is, is there. That analysis is poor. Um, there's another thing called the 85th percentile, which actually ignores the 15% of highest speeding vehicles. It's those highest speeding vehicles that the public are complaining about. It's not the average speed vehicles from the tube across the road. It's the ones that are at the top end of that that they're complaining about. The policy, as it stands at the present time, doesn't give enough weight to these facts for communities to be successfully arguing for lower speed limits. There almost seems to be some sort of ethos within highways that lower speed limits just will not be given if it's at all possible. And I can't understand why. Nobody's ever said to me it's because of the cost. Nobody's ever said it's because of extra journey times. It just is not a clear thing that, that happens. Um, Another source of information uh, about whether there are speeding problems is the, the police. The policy makes um, reference to asking the local police. I'm afraid the Dixon of Doc Green idea of the local police force or police officers having ideas of what goes on in their community is just not true in the modern policing world. My local uh, neighbourhood team, half of them live in Bristol. They don't know the area, they don't know the roads, they don't know the local landmarks. They don't know where the roads go. A police officer in my house talking about the motorbike problem that we had um, had a call to go to Monmouth uh, under blue light condition. He had to ask directions to go how to go to Monmouth from Shire Newton. <coughs> For, from us, that, that was... I don't make any comment about the way the, the police um, operating model is at the present time but it is too heavily relied on within the strategy that we'll go to the police and we'll ask them and they'll tell us whether there's problems. They don't know. They don't have the stats. Uh, local police don't have the stats. We had a helicopter up uh, a couple of years ago. Our local police knew absolutely nothing about it. It's probably somebody being chased over the border from uh, Gloucester, they believe. Vehicle crashed, um, fire, burnt the road. Local police spoke to him a couple of weeks later. They had no idea the helicopter had been up over the village for two hours. Roads were closed while they searched for the driver. I still have no idea what really happened there. It's conjecture. Local people are the ones who actually know what the problem is. Yet this policy actually specifically says that no local people will be invited to meetings. They'll take the information from them, but local communities will have no idea as to what weight is put on their information. It's suggested that things like near misses will be recorded. Who's going to decide what near miss is recorded? Um, the local community councils have no idea that they're going to be asked to record local miss uh, near misses. It's just not clearly um, Mr. Vincent, you've made some, you're making some very valid points. Could I, because we've got couple, to, couple um, minutes, can I just you ask would. you to just sum up now and just okay. um, make your main points to the committee? Thank you. The people raising the issues are the ones who have the experience, yet they're not going to be included in working groups. This doesn't seem to be an open and honest and transparent um, way of dealing with, with requests. Um, there's various things missing from the paper, um, your voice surveys, uh, police abandon these now. Uh, it's inappropriate for that to be mentioned in the strategy. Uh, Operation SNAP, a new police initiative, not mentioned. It's not surprising really from the, the reheated 10-year-old paper, but it's just not there. I don't believe that highways will fairly implement this policy. It, it, doesn't meet the needs of the rural community and it doesn't recognise it. 
just some points that I think that the paper should really try and uh, address is to regain some trust, allow lay people to participate in the working groups, allow an appeals process that stated that your policy is so robust you don't need an appeals process. I just don't think that's correct. Publish the results of any consultations, including the um, assessment uh, that's headed complaint assessment uh, form at the present time, bearing in mind that if it's not published, it'll be available under freedom of information anyway. Um, make sure that any suggested amendments from this uh, consultation as it's going on uh, are included and please stop calling people who raise these issues complainants. It's adversarial in the first place and it doesn't reflect people who have fears of their community because of speeding traffic. I think that, that that's probably it. Um, I don't know whether there'll be another opportunity to ever comment on this paper, but I would like some sort of acknowledgement that some of these points will be duly considered, and if they're not actually acted upon, um, the reasons for them to be given. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much indeed, and you've raised some very valid points, and thank you for coming along. Can I ask um, Mrs Squires, did you want to add anything no, no. to what's been said? Um, so if I could now call Mr Peter Farnsworth, um, if you'd like to address the committee. Uh, it's Peter Sutherland. No, no problem apologize. at all. Thank you very much indeed. I'll try and keep it brief. First of all, a couple of thank yous uh, to Roger Hoggins and his team for the work done at Usk Island Car Park in improving the security. I won't go into details as we're live streaming, but it's very much appreciated. We'd also hope that uh, ongoing discussions regarding moving the barrier nearer to the road can be pursued because we think that will further increase the security at the site. Again, a thank you um, to the County Council. We've put in a bid as a Community Council for resurfacing uh, Land Baddock Island uh, car park to uh, the Welsh Government. We're fingers crossed we'll get uh, some success on that. So once again, many thanks. Two other points. Endorse the comments made by Mr Vincent um, regarding road safety. One of the issues I was going to raise was the uh, progress since the workshop last October. And while the policy may be flawed, what we as a community council would wish to see is some progress on the ground. That would be uh, helpful to us. And finally, uh, I understand the um, future of the um, USK Civic Amenity Site is on your agenda. I'd like to stay uh, for that if I can, though I have another meeting to go to. But can we register our concerns as a community council uh, in terms of the possible closure or termination of days of operation on that site? That gives us and our residents uh, in Lambadic a great deal of concern, and I would like that to be registered with the Strong Communities uh, Committee on behalf of the Community Council. Thank you once again for the opportunity of addressing the committee. Thank you. Thank you very much in, indeed, uh, Mr Sunderland. And uh, I would like to thank the members of the public that have come along to address us today. You're always very welcome at this committee. And, you know, we really um, consider your, your contribution to be vital and, and extremely important. So thank you very much. It's not easy to come along and address um, in this chamber and I, um, we really appreciate your input. The business of, of today is the budget and um, Mr Sunderland's already mentioned it. Um, Councillor Eason. Yes, thank you Chair, but are we going to get a response from Highways regarding the comments that are made because they are valid and I think they should be, uh, there should be a, a response given from the Cabinet member or, or the head of, head of operations? Yes, I was just going to come on to say that um, what I would like to invite um, both of the public speakers is to, is to meet now with um, members from our highways team so that they can address their issues because obviously we don't have time to debate these and that is not the purpose of the public open forum. Um, so you're very welcome to, um, to meet with officers now if you would like to do that. So do you actually mean now to do so? Uh, no. Um, sorry, uh, Roger, are there officers available that would be able to speak to? Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, 
As for myself, I would be un it's un I'm unable to meet with uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Venter and Mr. Squires at the moment. Um, I've taken a note of the points which uh, Mr. Vincent raised, um, and I also took some notes at the Lower Y Area Committee. So we, we picked up on those. I'd be very grateful if Mr. Vincent would elaborate upon those in by way of a note, um, which we can then feed back into the um, into the um, draft, which comes back to yourselves as Strong Community Select Committee for for further consideration before ultimately it goes to cabinet. So I welcome that, but I, I got some notes of things raised, but I'd like to hear, have some more detail on that. It's your prerogative of members, if you wish to meet with uh, members of the public to look at that again, then, and we, would, we should facilitate that, then we can do that, so if you want that to, to be arranged. Okay, thank you very much. So, um, would I you- I just say, um, Thank you for the offer to be able to put it all in writing to you. Um, in campaigning to try and get a lower speed limit in our area, I spent many hours um, and many days collating information to try and persuade highways. I put this in writing um, at various times, um, and I didn't always get a response to that. Um, my personal preference would actually be to probably have a meeting with highways representatives, preferably, I think, probably Mr. Hoggins as head of highways or head of operations, um, and possibly the cabinet member. Um, my interest is no longer in my own area. We've now got a speed limit. It works <coughs> together with good police enforcement. Um, my interest is in trying to prevent future communities in Monmouthshire <laughs> having to go through the long, long, weary battle that seems to be par for the course of trying to get lower speed limits and a face-to-face -face meeting where issues can be raised specifically with counter-arguments that might persuade me that I'm totally wrong about these things, but an exchange of, of documents or a document that just disappears into a black hole that may or may not be acted upon, I'm afraid doesn't meet what I would actually like to see. So a face-to-face -face meeting where both sides can be prepared for what it is that they, they want to raise would be good if it could possibly be arranged. Well, thank you very much, and I'm sure that will be able to be organised. I think what we have to be mindful about is that this committee and the strategy is dealing with the county as a whole. Obviously, you've got a specific issue in your area. If no, I could, sorry, if I not, could, excuse specific. me, um, if it's, you could, if you could wait, please, uh, Mr. Vincent. I've got other members that need to be brought in. So, if I could, Councillor Webb, and then um, the portfolio holder, Councillor Jones. Thank you, Councillor Webb. Councillor Jones? Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to say to Mr Vincent, I'd be happy to have a face-to-face -face meeting with him, along with Roger, uh, Head of Operations, at, at a mutually convenient time. <laughs> Thank you. Councillor Eason? <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. I don't want to much time. But we've got lots of eight highways issues in Monmouthshire. We never seem to be able to resolve them. We seem to have committees which talk and talk and, and we don't get down to the number of things. I've got a letter here from Ken Skates regarding matters in the south of the county on highways matters. I think we've, we've somehow we've got to grasp these nettles and sort them out rather than spend time in committees talking about what we want to do rather than doing it. Thank you, Councillor Eason. Um, can I just bring in um, Mr Sunderland? Did you want to speak at this point? Very briefly to say we would welcome being involved in any any meetings which would pursue the road safety issues that have been raised today. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm sure that, uh, are you happy, Mr Sunderland, that, um, Ms. sorry, Mr Hoggins gets back, back to you in, in due course? So uh, Absolutely. I'm, I'm more than happy for, for Mr Hoggins to come back and, as uh, Councillor here has said, uh, arrange a mutually convenient time. I do not have any particular issue for my area anymore. We have got a speed limit. My interest is Monmouthshire-wide 
to try and prevent other communities going through what we had to do. So I have a, a much wider interest that once this is sorted, I'll go away and stop, stop being interested. But uh, at the present time, because of the expertise that I might say we built up over the years of fighting this, I believe we've got a valid voice that would help other communities in Monmouthshire. Nothing to do with our particular area. Just wanted to make that point clear. Thank you very much. And I mean, uh, we really appreciate your input today. I have to say that there is not one person in this room that is not as concerned about speeding as you are. We are all very concerned about it. And I was encouraged at my area committee yesterday when um, one of our officers gave his presentation. And certainly my experience is that we are, the whole intention in future is to be a lot more proactive. And um, whereas Welsh Government only look at fatalities, we now have the opportunity to meet with residents and look at the number of accidents and, you know, look at it in a much more proactive way. So I, I'm very encouraged by that and I'm sure that the meetings will be productive that you have. So thank you very much indeed for coming along and we now must move on to the main business of the day, which is to discuss the budget. Thank you very much. You're very welcome to stay if you wish to. Um, but thank you very much indeed for coming along. Thank you. So if I can now hand over to Councillor Phil Murphy. Um, I think all members have seen um, Councillor Murphy's presentation. I know I've seen it at least three times, so we are familiar with it. So in order not to stifle debate, um, Councillor Murphy um, feels that he'll go straight into taking questions. Did you want to give an introduction? Are we going to do the capital strategy first, Chair? Because um, yes, that, we that's are. on the, the agenda early, in, in which case Mark's going to do that, and then I'll come in on the rest. Thank you very much. Um, so, Mark, if, if you would like to ad address the committee. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, this year's document is a bit, bit heavier read than, uh, than is usual in relation to the, uh, the capital programme proposals, largely because we have a new responsibility on us as local authorities to actually uh, develop a capital strategy, which better ties resourcing and uh, <coughs> future resourcing over a 10-year period against things like the corporate plan, the um, asset management strategy, etc., all very sensible to uh, to undertake. Our primary responsibility in advance of that is to assess our preparedness in terms of our administration in meeting those requirements. So a lot of the early parts of this report goes to describe to members the decision-making process and the processing amongst officers of, uh, of valid schemes. So for instance, in navigating through the report, uh, paragraphs 4.5 to 4.10 describe the nature of expenditure that can be, uh, can be uh, assumed to be capital expenditure. Um, 4.17 describes the funding sources, and those are explored largely with regard to actually providing a priority setting matrix for the first time for members to, uh, to consider and, uh, and approve or, uh, or comment upon. Why are we promoting a priority-based approach? You may remember that, uh, that full council has set itself two conditions in relation to everything being added to the capital programme. It either needs to pay for itself, i.e. has a business case that is fully fundable and affordable in terms of paying the, uh, the borrowing and funding that results from it, or something that has a higher priority than something already within the capital programme. Obviously, that's our... Uh, uh, considerations for the last couple of years, but it probably hasn't been all that helpful to members to actually say, well, it's got to be of higher priority than something in the capital programme without perhaps giving you an indication of what we regard as being the ranking of relative projects. It is uh, quite subjective as to what those rankings are, and they're volunteered largely for the process of debate. And actually, if I explain why we've arrived at the ones that we have and some of the feedback that we've had from other select committees that might be helpful in your consideration. 
So first and foremost, our priorities around regulation, health and safety aspects in terms of being the number one priority. And I've put that actually ahead of setting the uh, a balanced budget and, uh, and meeting the aspirations of the corporate plan in terms of having those regulatory responsibilities on us, irrespective of matters of resourcing and affordability. I then consider off the ability to use the capital programme to either lever in extra resourcings from outside or to assist in terms of match funding schemes uh, that derives additional resources and that's not uncommon with things like Welsh Government grants where there's a degree of match funding. The one comment I've had from a couple of selects is that they'd like to see a higher priority in relation to using the capital programme to lever in resources from outside of the county um, and I think I can do that with actually uh, up in that ranking to uh, to close to the uh, the corporate uh, plan aspirations but i would still regard setting the balanced budget and the corporate plan aspirations to uh, to trump that consideration we then go into the capital program for next year and you'll be aware that actually having looked at the detail that actually the program has been built largely on a steady state approach so those programmes that derive an annual set of funding, things like programme maintenance, highways maintenance, county farms maintenance, DFG levels, have been retained intact. The largest part of our capital programme for the last couple of years has been in affording two new secondary schools, and that has cost the Council of the order of £90 million, which is a quite significant uh, project in relation to... Uh, mitigating the amount of work that you might be able to do elsewhere on other capital programme matters. Members have an aspiration around having a standardisation of secondary school provision and aspirations around a future schools tranche B and C accordingly. That hasn't yet featured into the capital programme because we haven't got cost certainty as to what that would be. But what I am doing in the short term is not necessarily allocating the, uh, the estimated capital receipts balances over the next four years, appreciating that's probably going to be our most significant <coughs> way of affording our proportion of it. The rules of the game have changed in relation to that, that in the past the council had to find 50% of the resourcing, so you can understand that actually in finding <coughs> £45 million worth of resourcing that actually that's had a, quite a significant impact upon pairing back, repairing strategies to, uh, um, to patch amend rather than whole-scale replacement. Um, going forward, the Future Schools programme, Welsh Government have described that they will pay for 65% and the authority would pay for 35%, but even on that basis, a new secondary school of the order of £40 million will still mean about a £14, £15 million funding consequence to the Council. Despite that, there are some shortcomings with our processes when we look at our uh, strategy and approach against the need for capital strategy. And one of those is around having robust and up-to-date information on which to actually assess the capital priorities. A lot of the information included in Appendix 1, um, whilst very laudable, is a couple of years old um, and has probably been in the... Uh, in the category that service managers haven't felt the need to be completely accurate with that as there's never the resources to actually address it and satisfy it. But I think if we regard health and safety and regulatory issues as a primary consideration, probably we need to reintroduce some of the uh, surveys and planning aspects around that more explicitly than we have for the last couple of years, which is why I volunteer 75,000 be used from capital receipts to, uh, to reintroduce that aspect. The other aspect that has gone to full council this last year is around the replacement of Seven View Care Home, which is coming to the end of its economic useful life. It'd be fair to say that we haven't yet had the business case for that that shows it's fully funded. We anticipate a shortfall and the £300,000 use of capital receipts again recognises that shortfall that actually it will not be in a situation where it can pay for itself but that actually the council has a responsibility to those residents and the future of that service to provide it. And those that have attended Adult Select or have an interest in this may understand that actually there's a res residential development going on in Crick Road. 
whereby there's some employment land that it would be sensible to co-locate the replacement care home on that site because that site is being developed with dementia-friendly principles and there's a lot of synergy between the two aspects. Um, the third aspect that I'm looking to do next year as a change but not as a re result of introducing further resourcing is splitting the property maintenance uh, budget more explicitly between direct works and staff recharges. I'd like to understand myself, and I'm sure members would, to understand the amount of direct works that 1.9 million buys you, as opposed to how much involved in staff recharging. Um, I can't do that too explicitly because obviously there are restrictions on what you can regard as capital program uh, matters, and staffing <coughs> usually is one of those things that is uh, it, more often treated as a revenue expense. Um, it, it's a bit of an un, unlevel playing field in that if you actually provided for your capital program administration from an outside agency, it would be treated as a legitimate capital expenditure. Whereas if you actually have a, uh, a, an in-house service, they would regard that as more of a running cost of the council. Those are the considerations for me going forward. Other council, other, Selects uh, have volunteered whether there's a possibility to carry on providing the extra £300,000 resources in relation to DFG that full council has set itself for the last two years. It did that in the last two years, recognising that there was a backlog in DFGs of the order of £500,000, but obviously it's recognised that actually DFG is a very sensible policy direction in relation to, uh, to keeping people in their own home and actually mitigating social care costs and, uh, and upheaval and volatility around uh, care and health provision. Um, so that probably takes you through a whistle-stop tour of the, uh, of the capital programme and the specific proposals for next year. I'm happy to take any questions before my voice goes. Uh. Thank you very much indeed, Mark, for, as always, giving us a very succinct um, precy of what is an incredibly complex subject. Um, so now if we take questions, uh, Councillor Roden. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, what are the areas of biggest uncertainty in the capital programme? Um, and is it possible to mitigate these uncertainties? Thank you. I think probably this, the single biggest aspect is, uh, is, is balancing the challenging item of managing the pressures and liability that the council has in relation to, uh, to affording the maintenance on its, <coughs> on its tangible assets against the resources that it's got to allocate to it. And I think officers do quite a good job in terms of sp spreading that resource across the county to make sure that everyone gets a little bit of it. But it'd be fair to say that probably the single biggest item within that pressures list at the moment is around highway maintenance and probably echoes some of the conversations that you had earlier this morning uh, uh, around the importance to, uh, to residents. What I, what I would say just in clarification is that the capital programme is an iterative process hasn't yet been finalised. There are a number of bids out with Welsh governments around uh, local transport fund schemes that will supplement it explicitly with highways work. We are aware next year through the final settlement that was provided to us after this was drafted that we will get, oh, thank you very much. Yeah. That we will get some additional resources as a local authority over the next three years. But obviously, recognising the priorities we've set ourselves at the moment, we've gone out to consultation on revenue with a £600,000 hole in setting that balanced budget. And actually, just at the moment, we have some certainty around some very important grants to us around post-16, around what the social care grant for this next year will bring. At the moment, I'm utilising a lot of that expense to actually uh, compensate for that bottom line. Should we get some explicit funding uh, notified to us? That I'm volunteering that actually that be used first and foremost in uh, in uh, supplementing the highways uh, process. But uh, you'll be aware that it's your choice rather than mine. I will only be recommending that because the capital programme is one thing that uh, that is agreed by full council, not necessarily delegated to cabinet. So you'll all have a a view and say on that uh, when the report comes to you in end of February March time. Councillor Roden, did you want to come back? Uh, yes, please, uh, Chair. Uh, my concern is interest rates. 
Uh, you have a uh, possibility of an investment committee raising 50 million pounds, but there are quite a few things happening externally that might uh, affect this aspect. I'm not just talking about Brexit, but there are also other councils that are going bankrupt. And I'm just wondering how uh, the agencies that loan funds to councils would actually uh, react. Thank you. Uh, members interested in that uh, particular aspect may want to uh, look at the report going to audit committee this afternoon that actually sets uh, or volunteers the annual treasury strategy for audit committee's consideration and then onward circulation to full council to, to agree they will endorse it or, or query it. In, in relation to our funding sources, unlike a private sector concern, we don't necessarily derive our borrowing from banks. There is a public institution called the Public Works Loan Board that provides uh, concessionary uh, loans to the public sector more generally. It's generally at a preferential rate to what the external market would derive. Um, that's our main source of borrowing. We will occasionally borrow off other institutions that are in the situation of being cash rich. Uh, and that's also a good way of, uh, of keeping those costs down. What we also do is adopt a, a policy of internal borrowing. So in terms of capital receipt levels that I report to you through this re report, it's right to report to them because they haven't been actually applied. But what we do is because that affects our cash flow beneficially on an ongoing basis, we will actually utilize those balances to avoid borrowing and keeping our borrowing costs low. We do recognise that probably the market is a bit unique at the moment insofar as longer term borrowing is generally more expensive than short term borrowing, um, which wouldn't traditionally have been the same for, the, for those people that uh, can remember buying houses and mortgages. Uh, um, but what that means is that what we effectively do quite a lot of at the moment is borrow short-term recurringly rather than tying ourselves into 30-year money because at the moment it's still financially beneficial to do that. Part of the work of my Treasury team is assessing when it's more appropriate to direct money into a longer-term aspect. Um, and actually we appreciate in the Audit Committee report that the interest rates are probably likely to increase by maybe half to three quarters of a percent over the this, this next 12 month period. The Treasury advice that we get from our Treasury consultants that uh, uh, supplement the work of the Treasury team is that it's sensible to have a look at your overall portfolio and make sure that you're not uh, oversubscribed in any one particular area. So what we have done more recently of late is actually moved a proportion of our necessary borrowing from short-term variable rate to more long-term fixed, because in that way we mitigate the, uh, the volatility in interest rates. We wouldn't do that for everything because the whole aspect around Council's Treasury Management is not to chase the most economic and effective rate, even though we have uh, struggled with resources more generally, it's to provide a prudent approach there that means that actually our costs are not volatile. And when we look at the revenue programme every year, we assess the revenue costs of repaying borrowing and whether it's affordable in the proposals that we give you as part of the revenue, uh, the revenue budget. Thank you, Councillor Roden, for that very interesting question and for an excellent answer. Um, if I could take Councillor Val Smith and then Councillor Eason. I've answered my one question now, Chairman. In my own mind, I remembered. Um, going to the 65% the grant that's going to come from Welsh Government, that's welcome for the schools. We've now constructed two schools. What's the process that's going forward now? I know it's the early stages. Um, on the two sites we've developed so far, they've been different contractors, haven't they? No. They were the same, the same design as well. Yeah. The same designers. I, I hadn't realised that, right? So, I'd be interested to know. It's an open plan. I mean, do we let's use the word competitive tendering? Do we go for that sort of thing when we go for our schools? Because I cannot understand over why there hasn't been a design that was acceptable and perhaps more economical over Wales. You know, there was a design book at one time for housing, 
Um, just right. I hadn't realised that about the same contractor. Thank you. Yeah, in, in relation to our two schools at Monmouth and uh, Caldicott, they are the same contractor. It, in terms of a tender of this size, the public sector does have to put it out uh, again. It wouldn't automatically utilise someone just because it's used them in the past. And actually, my recollection is that that tender was part of an approved list that Welsh Government had prepared in terms of already doing a lot of the pre-tender work. Because you can appreciate that a development of that size, there are only certain businesses in the market that are, have both the expertise uh, and the... Uh, and the the size of a workforce that would allow you to, to progress that. Welsh Government are looking, as are the Council's uh, Future Schools project team that is made up of, uh, of members and inf uh, supported by particular officers, are actually looking innovatively at what we provide by way of a uh, tranche B. So, for instance, Welsh Government are actually looking, if they adopted, say, a pattern book approach that a school in Monmouthshire looked exactly the same as a school in Pembroke, whether actually providing uh, so many schools to a particular contractor would result in economies of scales for everyone and make it a more economic process. What we have to regard is, obviously, we want a comparable standard of education and experience for pupils across Monmouthshire. So there is a certain regard for looking at the quality of the buildings in tranche A and making sure that actually any proposal is, is done, recognising that, that the pupils' experience will be similar. There are a variety of things going on at the moment around that costing exercise in terms of what's decided. There's some quite interesting things in the marketplace considering things like modular build, etc., where actually the majority of the build is actually done off-site and craned in over a summer period, which can be quite attractive when you actually look at it in relation to managing it around a, a school academic year and not having to, uh, to, to get the same extent of demountables. Um, but those things would actually be taken through the, uh, the, the future schools project group that, uh, that, officer, uh, that members sit upon. Thank you. Okay, Meg, I, I wouldn't want our children um, uh, in substandard accommodation or anything like that. Um, I've always been conscious, though, that the fact that what really matters is what goes on inside schools. It's not the building. It's got to be satisfactory building, but it's what's actually happening in the schools. But it's no... Um, thank you for that. And I... Yeah, I'll watch this one with interest. Where do reports... Can I ask, Chairman? I know it's not our committee, education, but I'm not aware of sort of look, sitting in meetings and hearing updates from that committee or group that are working on the future. Thank you, Councillor Smith. If I can just ask Councillor Murphy to come back on this particular point. Thank you, Chair. I was just going to add a, a bit about the uh, d d design. Uh, both of those schools um, that we've completed were designed very much around the curriculum and the requirements of the, 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 the staff and pupils. So they were designed specifically according to the requirements of, of uh, as I say, staff pupils and the, uh, the uh, cur curriculum. Um, the modular designs, the, uh, the pattern book uh, approach, uh, yeah, they're sort of mostly... Um, uh, converted um, supermarket designs uh, is probably a, a, an easy way of, uh, of putting it and uh, not very inspiring and, and not very friendly and not very adaptable either so um, we have been concentrating on making sure that, that we get the best possible uh, product out of that consultation exercise um, we have, from time to time, um, uh, gone back to uh, Council with updates of, on, on on what's happening, but they tend to be very long drawn out um, procedures. We have to do a five case business model. Um, we have to get that checked with Welsh Government all the way through. Um, we're looking at designs with the contractors. Uh, we're looking at what contractors. There's so much in it um, that it goes on for such a long period that certainly regularly reporting, I don't know what we'd report. Uh, it's just, uh, that at, at fixed stages we would come along and say, um, you know, this is where we've actually we've actually got to. Are you happy with that response, Councillor 
Yeah. yeah. If I could take Councillor Reese and then Councillor Jones and Councillor Guppy. Yeah. Just on that point, Chair, just to say that um, Children and Young People Committee get more regular updates, so it would be worth Val sort of checking in with them. Thank you. Councillor Guppy? No, just just to say, sort of, um, with the new schools, I think uh, I would strongly advise that you go back, um, Monmouthshire is a, a newer school, but to go back to Caldecott, because there has been some de design issues um, that has flagged up uh, within Caldecott School that um, has had major implications for the pupils' um, sound and health and safety, and they need to be addressed. Um, I know that they are being addressed, but they also need to be um, taken away for any new schools being built. Thank you, Councillor Guppy. Did Chair, you? can I just clarify that? Yes, there was an unfortunate in incident in Caldicott School. Um, can I uh, assure everybody, and certainly for the purposes of uh, people looking in, that those schools are built absolutely to the correct standard? Um, but yes, we are looking at, at whether or not uh, we can take measures to uh, prevent that particular occurrence again. Um, but. Um, they were certainly built to the correct standard required by the industry. Yeah, it, it was not so much with regard to the incident there, it's the finer things with regard to noise um, um, transferring um, when uh, children were in the canteen, um, and it would certainly uh, be worth having a, a full meeting with the school and, and also with Monmouthshire, sort of the, those fine nitty bitty things that, um, that you know, possibly was, a, you know, um, can't be considered in the initial design, but as a working school that are, are flagged up and, and making it difficult. Um, um, thank you. St staff are actually in, involved with the design team, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Guppy. If I could, at this point, bring in uh, Ms. Peter Davis. Yeah, just to reinforce the point uh, that has just been uh, the points that have just been made by uh, uh, Councillor Murphy. Uh, so just just to provide provide some reassurance, just in in terms of just ongoing ongoing process, as you would expect, uh, beyond obviously a, a new school opening of that size and magnitude, um, uh, our property services teams. Uh, and as Phil has touched, uh, touched on, uh, in conjunction with the design teams, you know, the, all the snagging uh, and the defect work that naturally continues once the school opens, um, you know, that is being worked through both on the Caldecott and the Monmouth sites. Um, uh, issues concerning, you know, any, any particular design issues, you know, that, that sort of feedback will be captured and de dealt with at an, at an operational level. And I think the only other further point to make, because I don't think uh, it's been explicitly touched on, uh, but beyond CYP Select, beyond uh, obviously decision making going through uh, cabinet and, uh, and subsequently council uh, uh, with regards to new school builds. Uh, there is a 21st century schools uh, board in place. Uh, that is an officer member board. Uh, there is a, um, a, a program, um, uh, a program, um, uh, program team uh, that meets and reports up into that board uh, and that oversees uh, not just uh, the conclusion of the two school builds that have been seen through and again your point of learning lessons and making sure that we take those now into uh, King Henry and beyond uh, uh, but uh, but clearly to oversee and manage uh, in particular Band B uh, and we're King Henry now over the coming 12 uh, 18 month period uh, and Will McLean as chief officer uh, he has put in place and is putting in place uh, a, uh, uh, a a, a different type of team structure to oversee King Henry, uh, given some of the additional complexities around it and the importance, and again, some of the learning around uh, and importance around change management uh, uh, from uh, you know, one school to another and making sure that is properly ingrained, uh, uh, certainly in terms of from an educationalist perspective, but also a change management perspective as well. Thank you, Peter. Are, are you happy with those reassurances, Councillor Guppy? Are there any other, uh, Councillor Eason? Yeah, thank you. Uh, before I ask a question, could I ask Richard if you could turn the temperature up a bit? It's a bit cold at the back here. <coughs> um, the point I want to make is regarding Councillor Roden's comments about the investment committee. The council agreed 
uh, some time ago to ag agree to a level of £50 million pounds being available for whatever within that uh, portfolio. But uh, reading articles in the press on Sunday, uh, councils in England who were under different uh, measures of, of, of support have in, in effect taken one, one, one and a half billion pounds worth of save, uh, uh, borrowings to function, carry out their functions. And there are question marks about the longevity of those schemes in as much as, okay, Brexit may come into it, I don't know, on whether they are actually viable in the future. So the, the £50 million pound that we have agreed to is in, in a, it's a, it's a drop in the ocean compared to what problems may be in elsewhere. Um, the question is really, um, to, to Mark, you mentioned £90 million pound capital spend on schools. Well, it, it was a £45 million-ish spend rather than 90 40 value was on grants, wasn't it? Um, two questions from in the report. The Cabinet note the potential forecast of capital receipts so using £75,000 receipts to, to balance to afford a condition survey. Where's that condition survey? This will be reckon, recognised in that actually in relation to holding our assets, the cost in terms of uh, uh, affording condition survey work, we'll be looking at whether some of those surveys require updating and that £75,000 will be used to actually provide for new surveys so it's not a specific place it's a, a broad thing okay the other question is regarding the the, the figure of three hundred thousand pound to assist the business case for crick road um could you expand on on that because it's a project that we need to get moving moving forward uh, under on, on the balance of the comments you're making is it is it viable well as at the moment Colleagues are going through the uh, quantification of those costs to be able to give members cost certainty. At the present time, it doesn't afford itself. So if I just explain to you, the, the, the nature of the project is of the order of six and a half, seven million pounds, if I recall correctly, to be paid for out of a mixture of um, the receipt on seven view, uh, a degree of independent uh, individual intermediate care fund funding and uh, changing management practice to reduce the revenue costs. At the moment, those two don't balance. Um, that's why I've put a buffer in there until the, uh, until the service manager and the quantity surveyors pay back their costs because they've still got to do an exercise on finishes and uh, looking at the architect's plans to see whether the uh, the proposals can be done in a more economic way. I suspect the level of resources they have to take out on that will still mean there will be a net cost and the capital receipts use of £300,000 is to recognise that. It's effectively to facilitate the project going forward rather than having to keep coming back over a number of iterations whereby they pare back their costs or sharpen their pencil to actually reduce the uh, the scheme accordingly. Can I come back on that? Uh, yeah, thank you for the explanation. But is that based on 30 beds or 48 beds? And if it's based on 30 beds, will there be adequate income, an income stream to provide for the outside sources to provide the other 16 beds? They're actually looking at two business cases at the moment. The base case is for the 32 replacement to 7 view. There has been a consideration largely raised by Adult Select as to whether actually there's an opportunity here to extend that to 40, 48. The conversations are progressing with the likes of health, etc., in terms of the affordability of that, because obviously a lot of those are health-related beds and would need a, uh, uh, a, rental, a, a rental stream for those beds to actually afford the additional costs of moving from a 32 bed up to a 48. One further addition then. Would this fit into the Investment Committee's portfolio of actions? No, I, I, I can't see why it ordinarily would. This is a capital expenditure decision for full council. Um, the investment committee's work, you'll appreciate, I've described a number of times that actually it's full council that decides capital priorities. What it's done, given the sensitivity of some of the negotiations around commercial investments, by necessity has created a subcommittee to look at investments, 
but the primary consideration of looking at any investments is that those have to provide sufficient return to the council to afford the borrowing. Seven View and Crick Road replacement falls more in the service provision aspect than it does a, uh, a consideration of an investment opportunity. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Councillor Eason. Councillor Guppy. Uh, just to, to, to make a comment, you said um, if there was an increase, is it to 48 beds, um, and there is um, a health cost around that. There's a health cost around that anyway, because quite often there's a long waiting list for Seven View, um, and then other um, beds need to be found, maybe within the factor so they're paying for it anyway wherever they go um, so i would say that that's a neutral health cost um, be, because whether it's not in, it's not in seven view it's somewhere else um, with regard to uh, residents within monmouthshire i understand the uh, the perspective um, the nature of moving from a 32 to a 48 bed is specific around extra care, which moves it very much from a social care service to more of a health consideration. The council doesn't have the ability to move to that model without considerations of other partners and whether this forms part of their strategy and thinking. Um, so I think the conversations with health colleagues are probably appropriate. Council could decide to do a 48 bed on, on its own. I would suggest to you that in affording a 48 bed without any additional funding coming into it means that some of your other aspirations around, uh, around schools, around DFGs, around meeting your liabilities for the assets you already hold would, would, be, uh, would be even more compromised than they are uh, at the moment. So there's always a balancing, item to, uh, balancing aspect to be struck with some of this, but obviously I acknowledge that it's it's a member decision rather than an officer one. We can, we can only uh, advise and recommend. Are you ha thank you, Mark. Are you happy with that response? Are there any more questions around the cap capital strategy assessment? I think we've had we've had um, some some excellent questions from members on our investments, the twenty first century school, Seven View. And obviously, you know, we're aware of the balancing act that Mark refers to. So thank you all very much indeed, members. I think that's um, been given a, a, a very good airing by us. Is there anything you'd like to add, Councillor Murphy? Not on this topic, Chair. Mark, thank you very much indeed. And I think we'll now move on to agenda item five, which is the summary revenue budget proposals for 2019-20. Yes, thank you, Chair. And uh, I think just about everybody has seen the uh, present, general presentation on the budget at least once. Um, so I hope I'll uh, save you from death by PowerPoint today. Um, the, um, the position still remains that uh, without the consultation uh, with that gap of 594,000, um, work is going on apace to uh, try and close that gap, uh, but the uh, situation is still, as far as anybody uh, here is concerned, that that is still the, the um, gap that we're uh, trying to, uh, to close. Um, I would appreciate it, Chair, if we could keep our questions today to the um, remit of this uh, scrutiny committee, um, not least because um, the officers that we've got here are the ones who would be able to, uh, to, to answer it. Um, there's a couple of points here um, in the report that um, uh, are particularly worthy of, uh, of uh, uh, comment. Um, but um, I think I'll just leave it for uh, members of the committee to uh, ask any questions that they have rather than have too much of a preamble. Thank you, Councillor Murphy. And if um, I could now ask Mark. Yeah, I'd just like to make a point of clarification, to be honest. I mean, uh, I, I was hoping in providing an abridged report at the front there that focused select minds on their portfolio and their queries that actually what this meant was I was assured that every proposal got an airing at a, uh, at a select meeting. 
Um, what I've noticed since actually preparing this that actually uh, um, I haven't actually put the operations proposals on this list for this committee. Um, it did go on one for economy and development, but I do appreciate that actually you have a close involvement and interest in things like car parking and the ops aspect. So uh, I would say, yes, please restrict yourself to the abridged report, but I have asked Roger to be here uh, explicitly anticipating your interest in, uh, in matters to do with the operations department. Thank you very much and um, thank you for your clarification and certainly during the pre-meeting um, members have some excellent questions on the topics that are um, you know that, that, that concern this committee and the, the communities that we represent so um, I think during our pre-meeting we had a number of questions around car parking um, so who would like to kick off Councillor Roden uh, thank you chair um, I recently received a letter from a Monmouth and District Chamber of Commerce. Uh, it uh, contained a lot of feedback from members. It goes, uh, I'll make some of the points they've made. Uh, any increase in car parking charges are likely to further reduce the footfall in our town. Uh, Sir John Thomas's The High Street Report of December 2018 clearly recommends that councils should be considering easing parking charges, not increasing them. Uh, they objected to reducing the incentive for 1,200 blue badge holders and uh, things along those lines. They made about 15 points. I think that there's clearly an issue about the increase in car parking charges. I think that what we should do as a council is to actually measure any reduction in uh, use of the car parks as a result of these charges uh, and then mitigate against them. So in order to assess what's going on, we need to have feedback on car parking use, and I don't know if that comes through the uh, collection of uh, monies from the car parks or not, but it would be quite, I think it's really important to maintain footfall in our towns, and if it's related to uh, car parking charges, these need, the, the impact needs to be monitored very carefully. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Roden. And I have to say, at our area committee yesterday, we had very similar sen sentiments from the business community, the Chamber of Commerce chairman, um, also reflecting what, what you've uh, just highlighted. So, um, Ms. Roger, would you like to um, respond, please? Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, yes, if indeed you, you proceed with this, obviously, consultation exercise. Um, if you then wish to gather the information about usage, then that will be available from the, the machines, assuming you've got a charge on there, because that's the only reason you've got a machine. Um, so, but that, that information is available um, from those machines about, about level of usage. Um, Sorry, uh, uh, how will it be reported to us? Or will we learn about it? Uh, I'm quite keen that this is uh, something that we are made aware of, if possible. Uh. Yeah, it's um, information which can be can be provided to members by way of a listing of, of level of usage in each in each car park where where the machines are installed, and it'll provide you with that with that information. Um, I, if, if members wish to see it, we can provide it. Mm quarterly, six monthly, however they wish to see it, quite frankly, uh, it, 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 it can be generated automatically. Thank you. Um, is this something you'd like more information on before we, we have the budget uh, council meeting? I, I think that uh, it's the, the impact afterwards that we need to be aware of. Uh, if there's a significant decrease in footfall, uh, it will impact uh, on business rates eventually as there are more shop closures. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, if we can just make sure it's monitored uh, carefully and then respond if we have to. It might be that people will continue to use the, the car parks as they normally do. And it, in, if that's the case, all's well and good. But if they don't, then we need to react to the market. Thank you, Councillor Roden. Roger. The only comment I would like to make, Madam Chairman, is um, shopping aids is, is much more, the, or the, the popularity of our shopping, of our towns, our shops, our retail offer, 
from research which has been undertaken is much more complex and purely surrounding the car park charge. And there is some, um, some information which would suggest that actually the charge, as long as it's reasonable, may not be a material decision within whether or not an individual goes to a particular town to shop. The, the rationale behind going somewhere being more what the offer is in terms of that retail centre. In other words, do you want to go there in any event, be that a destination <coughs> shop or a general retail offer? So the actual issues surrounding that are significantly more complex and purely around car parking. So the impact in terms of take-up may not purely be around the charge, but around the, the broader offer within each, within each town. Nevertheless, we can provide the information. Thank you. If I can just bring in Councillor Murphy and then Councillor Webb and Councillor Jones. Yes, thank you, Chair. And in, in view of the, um, the responses that we've had to the uh, budget consultation so far, we have been collecting a lot more information uh, regarding um, vacancy patterns, um, uh, uh, general usage. Uh, there's lots of information uh, which is being uh, collated at the moment so that when we as cabinet and senior leadership teams sit down and decide what the final version is of the budget is, we'll have all, all of that at the hand. Um, but it is true to say that, uh, as uh, repeating really what Rogers just said, it is the offer that's in the place that, uh, that, that, that matters. Um, shopping habits have got far more to do with um, uh, what's happening in our uh, town centres than than the um, car parking uh, charges. Nobody is going to go from Abergavenny to, to Camban just to save 40p. It's, you know, it's just ridiculous to think that. Unfortunately, that's what a lot of people have been saying. And, and I, think, I think emotions uh, taken, taken over a bit. So I think it's important from that point of view that we do have all of this data, this additional data, so that we can look at it in the, in, in the cold light of day. Thank you, Councillor Murphy. Councillor Webb? Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, I think that Chepstow really um, is suffering mostly regarding this because in Monmouth you have a certain amount of free parking to do with the shops as you do in Abergavenny and in Caldicott. But in Chepstow you don't have that facility. OK, Tesco's are out of town virtually for people to, you know, to access the town. And I think Chepstow suffers more than any town with regard to this. Just wanted to make that point, please. Yeah, um, Councillor Murphy, then Roger. Um, yeah, I would have I would have said that it was very interesting though that the public engagement session last night nobody turned up, so they can't care about it that much. The, un the only point I would, would like to make when the, when members reviewed <coughs> car parking the last time and we inter in. Um, you approved the implementation of new charging regimes, short stay, long stay, discounted weekly charges, <coughs> the investment in new machines. We undertook to continue to provide one free car park in each town, uh, which largely we, we have done. Uh, it's a little bit further out in Chepstow, it's the leisure centre. In Monmouth, it's on Rockfield Road. And in Abergavenny, it's Byfield Lane with the exclusion of Tuesdays, but there is a free car park in each of the towns. Thank you. Councillor Jones. Thank you, Chair. I, I think that when competing with out-of-town shops, I think we need everything that we can to sort of be able to compete with them, and so sort of not having car parking charges would be the ideal thing for me. I've always been dead set against them. I do think they're killing off our small towns. However, for example, for in us, where we have free parking, um, there is a massive problem of people parking in the car park all day. So, um, in an area committee the other day, we were discussing it, and I thought it was actually very wise to have two, three hours free so people can do their shopping, do have a meal in the town, so it doesn't put off people going to the town. And then after that, so it discourages people from parking there all day, have some sort of minimal charge. That's fine for me. But the only problem on that is that 
people don't really carry change on them anymore and it's an absolute nightmare to put 50p fine 50p or whatever so i'd be if we are going to do something like that um i think we need to have the up-to-date machines where you can have contactless pay payment and make it really easy for people so it doesn't put them off because looking for change and things actually would make my decision to go elsewhere <laughs> Um, it's as simple as that, I think. I think people wouldn't mind if there were then spaces, for example, in Usk to park, and it was much easier that they wouldn't be um, put off by a minimal charge. Thank you. In relation to the machines, new machines going in, um, there are contactless machines in all of the main car parks. Um, <coughs> your member's quite right that they, it, it can put people off. It's even frustrating to me when I can't find one pound ten and I have to put one pound twenty in. It just demonstrates my agricultural background, I suspect. Um, but uh, they are becoming, they are contactless. Most of the machines have been rolled out now. I mean, in, in relation to ask, um, assuming the funding comes into place, members have already agreed to carry out a broader review ar around um, ask. Uh, about its retail offer, its car parking strategies, its public realm. So there is, members have put funding aside for that. So it will probably fall into that. And nevertheless, I believe members as part of this proposal have asked that a, uh, a wider review of the car parking strategy be undertaken during the coming, coming year in any event. It's Thank also true, uh, Chair, sorry to uh, butt in, that we are in negotiation with with us, Town Council, about the whole whole public realm in, in ESC, and that would automatically form part of, of that, so whether they take it on, what they do, whatever. Thank you. I mean, that's a very important question, as we've discussed at, at previous meetings at this committee, how our high street is changing, and it's one thing that we, as a committee, will have to keep a very close eye on. Um, if I could take Councillor Guppy and then Councillor Webb. I just sort of wanted further clarification. Has the council got their hands tied in view of what they can spend um, the monies from the car parking? Um, and if so, um, could we have a fuller report? Um, and if not, we don't need that. And then my second question is, um, we need to look at um, the availability of of spaces uh, and if there's a parking issue within the community and specifically with um, Seven Tunnel Junction with additional car parking site. I know that that's um, been ongoing and I know that um, uh, I, I presume that you're, you're talking about um, over the bridge, the railway bridge. But before any uh, parking is imposed, um, I, I would Firstly, a request that um, the partnership with Roggett Community Council um, monies are forwarded. Um, that's been ongoing for 18 months, and I'm not quite sure if the Community Council has received a penny as yet with the joint partnership on the um, um, land. And also, um, please, can you address, before any further um, parking um, payment is um, imposed on the car park site the station road at the beginning of station road is looked at i've requested it it is requested um, that restricted parking at the at the beginning of station road or all the station road um, is looked at because there are particular difficulties with the old pensioner site uh, the beginning of station road uh, at the junction of caldicott road where commuters are park in there and the access to the bungalows are causing issues in review of emergency and <coughs> emergency vehicles cannot park in that area because they are blocked up by commuters parking um, and that they park too near the junctions and trying to get the, the police to um, sort that out is is ongoing issue and it's, it's a regular issue mm -hmm. Um, but in view of payment for, for, for further parking at Seven Tonne Junction, it fits in with the rest of the area, and if it's um, a way of um, increasing some income, then I, I, you know, I, I'm for that, but not before the par parking or some restricted parking um, at the beginning of Station Road is um, applied. 
Thank you, Councillor Guppy. There are various points raised there. Would you like to respond, Roger? Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, Councillor Guppy is quite right to raise it. The funding cannot just be used as general income to the authority, um, and that is referred to within the existing budget draft budget proposals, and the funding is used to, to pay back um, the investment into car parking, car parking management, public transport, um, traffic management, and the like. It, obviously, it's in the context of you setting your budget overall, because if you, if you generate less money in car parking, then do you have to reduce it in those other areas which is currently supporting? But you cannot just use the funding um, across the authorities as a general income stream. It has to be invested back in. I, I understand the accountants are aware of that in setting the budget overall. It may not be explicit that that bit has gone to there, but in, in setting it, that's part of the ethos behind it. Um, I'd refer to Severn Tunnel Parking Site again. You will see in the report there's reference to, but I believe, about £100,000 investment required. I'll just pick up on the Severn Tunnel because in the budget as it's set at the moment is about creating a fairly basic additional car parking space at Seven Ten or over the bridge. Yes. Um, but there are, and we have bid for much greater funds to put in a proper tailor-made park and ride, so members are aware of that. This is um, um, a, a very basic extension of the informal parking which is over there at the moment but it would include a charge. Um, I'm sorry if Rocket Community Council haven't had any payments. I'll follow that up. It's part of the agreement. Um, I'll see what's happened there. Point about Station Road well made. Um, and we are conscious of the fact that whilst you encourage more to use public transport, there is an impact upon residents by doing so. So we need to be seen to take that on board and see what may be done. The end, specifically around that, while I would be concerned about driving off Station Road further into the estate, so it probably needs a piece of work around that. Anyway. Yeah, it was just the impact on the elderly community. Okay. And if there was, you know, no park in between. Sorry, if there was like no park in between nine and ten, it would stop the commuters parking yes. there. <sighs> Thank you. Are you happy with the response that you've received, Councillor Guppy? Um, Councillor Eason, then Councillor Roden, did you indicate you wanted to speak again? No, Councillor Eason. Uh, thank you, Chair. Can we discuss the... Oh, the gentleman's gone. I was considering the op opening and closing of, tr of the waste, waste centre. He's gone. I thought we could have discussed it, but he's not here. Um, I, I think, Councillor Eason, if we, can, if we can stick to parking and blue badges, and then we'll, we'll move on to waste after that, if that's all right with I, you. I th uh, Sorry, Councillor Webb. Sorry, just one quickie. Um, I wonder if Phil has got any feedback on um, the, blue, the cost of the charging for blue badges from the meeting that he's attended. I'd just be glad to know of the, uh, of any response to that, please. Um, yes, Chair. Um, there, there has been um, some uh, responses regarding uh, blue, blue badges, um, both from um, uh, disabled people and carers. Um, the, there's general di disquiet a, a, a about it. Um, I think people are relatively uh, happy with the fact that we propose to give the first hour free. There was a lot of, um, of uh, uh, angst, if you like, about um, how that hour would, would, would be used up. And Roger very helpfully at one meeting said, well, um, if it takes half an hour to get the, the individual sorted out, uh, you buy your ticket after you've done it. You know, um, there's ways around. Um, this is uh, part of the, the consultation. We are taking everybody's views in, in, into account. Uh, and the straight answer to your question is yes, I have had representations. Um, some of them have been uh, quite, uh, quite detailed and um, we're certainly gonna take them on board. Thank you. Are there any other uh, any other questions from members on this aspect of disabled parking, or any views that anybody would like to express? Could I, could I just say I'm not quite sure an hour um, if if you're going to impose park a charge for blue bad parking. Mm. I'm not quite sure an hour that f for the first hour free is long enough. You know, it won't won't perhaps not encourage them 
to make that trip in the first place. And if it was a bit longer, maybe they would use the, the local towns a bit more. Um, um, if it was going to be hour, I would say a minimum of two hours. Thank you, Councillor Guppy. Councillor Eason. Yeah, it is on the car parking now. I thought we finished that earlier. Um, there are different uh, strategies across different towns, but I, I noticed that in Abergavenny there's been a problem with um, the fact that Morrisons give, is it two hours free? And uh, they're, they're after whatever. Um, in Chepstow, as far as I'm aware, one of the shops there, Max and Spencer, they, you, you pay for a park and then you claim it back on your shop in. Um, Caldecott at, at the moment has a problem with, even got the foot, foot, footfall in the town, so we don't have any car parking charges as yet. Um, so I, I, I don't have a view on the charges, but um, if you then look at Monmouth, it is quite, conge quite a congested place. Um, there doesn't seem to be, other than I think Waitrose there also charged very similarly to Aberdeen. Am I correct? So are we? Are we? Sorry. One and a half hours. One and a half hours. Caldecott, Caldecott Waitrose has not Waitrose, but the company owns the park has introduced a two-hour free parking, um, which is. After the, after the first two hours, is three pound fifty or one pound fifty. I'm not quite sure, but two fifty then. I think we should look at our strategy across the county in terms of maybe encouraging parking by letting everybody have a first hour free and then ramp things from there. Uh, it, it might help the Abergavenny situation and the and other towns. I don't know what you feel, committee, but in terms of Caldecott, there are no problems. Thank you for that suggestion. And um, first of all, would any members like to? make any comments, either agreeing or... Councillor Smith? Sorry, it doesn't matter, you'll hear me. Um, I think the same policy across all of Monmouth would be ideal. It's confusing if you've got one system in one area and something in somewhere else. There's no greater deterrent to me to go into shop locally than the fact that I can't find a car parking space. And very little reminisce, I went shopping in New... Well, I didn't show... I had to go to Newport. So I parked where I've parked in bygone years. And I found that they've got one covering charge. It was the car park adjacent to the railway station. And it's a single, straightforward £10 charge. No ifs, no buts, and it was packed. It struck me that is a real mine... A real little gold mine for what, whoever operates that... But no, the deterrent to shopping, if I can't find a car parking place, it will turn me away from that area. And on a cheerful note in Usk, I noticed last night driving through that the shop that's been empty for years was actually being occupied. So that's a plus for Usk. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor Murphy? I think all of these points, Chair, are going to come out of the review that uh, Roger was, uh, was uh, talking about um, we can't, we can't at this stage extend the budget considerations into other, other areas. We, we've, we've really got to look at, at just what's in, in the budget. And yeah, we've taken everybody's message on board and we, we will be reviewing that. Um, but that, a lot of that is going to depend on how we manage to, to plug that £594,000 gap and whether or not there's any headroom, if we get any further support from Welsh Government on things like teachers' pensions and things like that, that might give us some, some flexibility. At the moment, we don't know. Thank you for that clarification, Councillor Murphy. Um, so are there any other, other points that anybody would like to make around blue badges and car parking? No? Um, Count Roger? Could I make one point then? And going back some time, you did have a charge of, you had free for one hour or a charge for one hour. The member's decision at that time was not to have an hour because it encouraged everybody to rush around and not actually look at the shops. Some members will remember that. So just to, I, as you're we going through it, I just recall that was one of the drivers behind putting in a two hour charge. So. It will come through the review, but that's, I, I do recall that being one of the drivers behind not ha having a free hour. Councillor Jones. Yeah, I completely agree. It's not, it's not enough time to, to, to go and um, have lunch in a cafe and then do some shopping as well, for example. It's just not. So one, I, don't, I'd always, I don't think one hour is enough for free parking. It needs to be two more, or more. 
yes. And I, I, I think, you know, shopping habits now, it's very much around uh, not just shopping. It's a leisure thing of, of going and having a coffee and, you know, having, having some time to have something to eat, etc. Okay, so Councillor Eason. Just, just one quick comment in terms of what Councillor Joan said. Really, if it was a first hour free, you sort of buy into get one free. That's the way I see it. Okay, well, we, we look forward to, um, and obviously shopping habits and the uh, consult you, the information that um, is going to be available to Cabinet, I think, about, you know, people's shopping habits and, and, and how it's changing. Because one thing that I was interested in was Councillor Murphy brought up at our area committee that actually, you know, in 2008, there was over 8% of empty shops in Abergavenny, and now there's just over 4%. So, you know, it, it, it's not perhaps as bad as, as um, some of the perceptions might be. Do you want me to, want me to, to quote that again? It is, it is yes. very interesting, just, just for the benefit of... Um, and I will just do the Abergavenny line. Um, in 2014, there were 5.1% uh, of shops uh, empty. In 2015, it went to 5.8. 2016, it went to 8.7. In 17, it went down to 6.3. And in 18, it was 4.8. So it's now half of what it was a, a, a couple of years ago. So the, the perception that uh, businesses are closing down in Abergavenny, and you've got a similar um, uh, uh, pattern in most of the other places um, is just not borne out by the uh, facts but I do understand why people think it. Yes and I think also that that's a good illustration of the very significant investment that the council have made in Abergavenny and how it, it's having a positive impact. So um, having aired car parking and disabled bad charges um, if we can now move on to um, household waste and issues around that and councillor eason you have a question you'd like to ask on that you you asked a question you wanted to ask a question earlier on on the waste aspect we're now moving on to that thank you Jay. i was th i was thinking of the um the center's been open and closed um yes i think we Open on that one. Can we can we discuss the closure of the closure and opening of the um, waste centres? Now we can we most probably fall into other categories because I think they're all interlinked. Quite honestly, a lot of Rogers' portfolio it swings around about. So you 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 may, may lose on grounds maintenance. You may gain on something else. So can we discuss these opening and closing of of the waste centres? Do you have a specific question on that, Councillor Eason? Um, I have received some concerns about other centres other than five lanes. Five lanes we could close one day. I don't find that as a problem. But as the gentleman did mention about USK, there are question marks about USK and Monmouth, both centres, as the viability of them in the long, long term if we don't provide, if we're not available, able to provide a full service. The service we, we are, I don't know whether we're required to provide it or not, we're required to provide, in my mind, just one place. Now, we do provide four. So the balance has got to be on how we, our operations department get that balance right across those four. There are concerns in us, and there are concerns in Monmouth. Thank you. I think if we take the questions now from Councillor Webb and Councillor Jones, and then Roger can come back on all three. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. I've asked a few people around, you know, their, their, their feelings about this. And basically, I think that they find it's going to be really confusing, two days closure in us, and four days, two days in Monmouth, and then um, the five lanes one as well. Um, is it possible to reduce the opening hours? I don't know. This, I don't know if it's possible to reduce the opening hours rather than close for two days in the main um, recyclable centre. Thank you. Councillor Jones, and I think Councillor Roden had some points to make about Monmouth as well. Okay, thank you, Chair. I'll, I'll let you talk about the days, open days then. Um, yeah, just just to say that the facility in ASK is... is um, very necessary. I completely agree with the concerns raised by Lambadoc Community Council that it needs that the facility needs to stay open. Um, and uh, I've had many people in us saying exactly the same thing. Um, long term, it'd be brilliant if it could be relocated so we could open up the car park more. But as it stands, we need a facility there. We need a facility in us, so it has to stay until there are alternatives. Um, 
yeah, the, the, on the days. I'll, I'll let Richard talk about that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jones. Councillor Roden. Uh, thank you. Um, some residents have approached me with regard to the days of closure at the Troy Amenity site. They expressed a concern that if the site, uh, site was closed on a Thursday and Friday, that the site would have a massive overloading on a Saturday and Sunday. And I, I tend to agree with that. I'm concerned that the uh, road between Mitchell Troy and uh, Trellick and Monmouth would be uh, almost impassable on occasions if we do this. So bearing in mind that Usk is a lighter used site, and I don't think it has a road uh, um, in the same way that we have a road passing our site, would it be possible to switch the days of uh, closure between those two sites? Have Monmouth, if we have to close it, um, uh, closed on a Monday and Tuesday uh, instead. I think it would make things flow a lot more easily. Thank you. Thank you, members. Some very important points raised there. Roger, would you like to come back? Do you have them all? To start up with uh, Councillor Eason uh, and whether or not um, all four are viable. Uh, we've asked for a, uh, actually, Welsh Government to. Uh, are funding a study of our civic community sites um, and their viability in the long long term. You you have two very modern sites, Five Lanes and Lymphoist, which are, are very fit for purpose. Um, then Monmouth, Troy as well, Troy, and then bring up the rear perhaps ask in terms of the, their suitability as a modern recycling centre and civic community site. So we have asked for um, a study on what might be feasible for the future. <coughs> I think the difference between, practically the difference between uh, uh, Newport or Torvine is, is the geography and whether or not um, people are willing to travel those, those distances to a civic community site albeit if there aren't any men, any other options, then it could be options choice. It, we'll see what comes from the study, but there's no doubt that two have had a great deal of investment, two others, um, they try and ask, are in need of investment, relocation or something to, to improve those sites. Um, the idea of reducing opening hours has been raised uh, it's a bit of a balance one against the other um, I, and neither of these are going to be universally well received are they whether, you, whether it's two days and remain the same opening hours the issue around reducing hours but um, remaining open seven days it reduced the labour reduction in labour costs which you can achieve by closing two days so if you have full closure it offered us a better saving so on balance, we felt that that was a, a better way forward. Take the point that it will be confusing for individuals and frustrating as they turn up to the gate and it's locked. Um, nevertheless, they will become familiar with the opening times eventually. And if they're in a re if, it, if it's if they really have to move that stuff there and then that day, then there are other sites. Yes, they're further away, but they are there and they will be open. There will be sites open every day of the week. Um, Councillor John, we've already had feedback about how, how USC um, values the site. However, there are issues around the operations of that site. There is an impact upon car parking. Um, uh, and there's, there has been uh, the issue upon car parking is around the safety of the site. The site also needs investment in any event. If it was to remain as is, it would need investment and it's very limited in what materials it will take. That's fine to ask. So um, in terms of its future, um, the, the study will highlight the pros and cons around it, the needs and, or not needs about that, and it will then... I suspect, fall into that wider ask study. So whilst that does sound like it's kicking it down the road a little bit, ultimately something has to happen with that site because it needs investment if, it, if indeed it's to remain open. Um, 
switch closure days uh, between ESC and Monmouth. I was, I was busily texting my colleague earlier to, because Councillor Roden had raised this with me before. Um, top of my head, I can see no reason why you would, can't swap them. Um, but I, I will come back to, back to members and no doubt members will want to take this into account when they finally take their decision around the budget. But at the moment, I can't see any reason why you couldn't swap them. I would have to say, in terms of usage, Troy is much busier than us. Ask is by far the quietest side. Thank you. Have you Councillor Jones? Yeah, just to say, for points of clarification, um, Mr. Hoggins, is, so are you looking at viable alternatives, alternative sites um, to use instead of us, should it have to close? Because I, I, the fact that we could have a period of time without any facility in the USC area itself is just not good enough. So are you looking at that now so the overlap can be there? Thanks. There's been informal um, conversations about where a site might be found and the viability of that, um, or whether a site could be found which is um, which would allow an improved site for us and Monmouth in another place. So to so combine in the two. So there are various options which have been looked at. Hopefully it'll come through that study. But yes, there have been conversations about if we haven't got it there, what else could we do? Where else could we go? Um, but there are, there are, those haven't been formalised into any sort of report at the moment, um, but it would probably be linked on to the, feed, the work which is being done by um, Welsh Government or, or a consultant on behalf of Welsh Government on behalf of us at the moment in relation to our civic community sites and recycling centres. Um, it was a concern I raised at, um, I think it was the area committee that you reported to about um, the USC facility and the other facilities. Um, and it concerned me greatly that the, the stats used to see whether USC was used a lot were actually general stats from, from all of Monmouthshire, where the people used, are coming to the facility. It wasn't in the USC area where, who's using facility. The people surveyed, there was a survey of 2,000 people or something like that, the gentleman from your office said. Um, and so it didn't make any sense to me. It was completely nonsensical and I wouldn't use those stats. So as long as they're a, People from ASK at this time are going to be asked in surrounding areas whether they use the facility to gain a real, true picture of what's going on. Um, that would be great. Thank you. Very quickly, madam, I, the, the stats which I refer to are, are simply tonnage, the level of tonnage being received at each site. There's, there's figures for each one. <coughs> so that's, that's one same thing. I, I, there may well have been. Um, um, stats are around usage. I, that's not what's in my mind. I am think talking about the actual tonnages which, uh, which are uh, which arrive at each site. Thank you. Happy with that, Councillor Jones. Councillor Roden. Uh, Mr. Hoggins, um, I would foresee that the level of black bag usage uh, would increase if we uh, closed the sites even for a few days. It will actually, if it actually happens, it would be indicative of of what would happen if we closed the sites for a longer period of time. So maybe that would be, give us some uh, uh, causes for concern in our collections and possibility of flight tipping. Uh, secondly, at a previous meeting, I raised the possibility of payment for use of the site and uh, people didn't like the idea of cash on site. Um, uh, a scheme has been proposed to allow people from outside the county to have permit of certain description. I personally think that uh, something like that is expensive to set up, and why not use contactless payment as an alternative, which is simple, easy, and most people have contactless these days. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Roden. Um, would you want to take another question on the same topic? Is it related, Councillor Webb? Yes, I think it is, yes. Um, just um, with regard to that, I would um, have suggested that um, if we are going to identify people that have actually a residence in Monmouthshire, um, that we can use the little clip-on, I don't know how you describe them, the little 
um, like you do and do not disturb in a hotel, those sort of things that you can clip over your mirror rather than something on your dashboard because the um, people, the operatives, can see quite clearly then as you enter the tip whether you are authorised to actually um, use that. Thank you. Thank you. And, um, and obviously we must uh, bear in mind that in Monmouthshire we have, you know, we're very well served with recycling sites and this particular issue that we have with people from other counties, we're a victim of our own success really, because in neighbouring counties, Blyna, Gwent and Powys, there is only one such facility. So we have got this issue with people coming across county boundaries and we're actually paying to to uh, recycle their, their rubbish. Um, but two very good suggestions there. Um, Mr Hoggins, would you like to come back on those two points? And then I'll take a question from Councillor Jones. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, increase in blue in black bag usage. Um, uh, frankly, I would, I would hope not. Um, but obviously, it's a risk. Um, it's perhaps not a... a, a uh, direction which I've heard before, I have a suggestion of fly tipping. I believe Councillor Rowe did mention fly tipping. Um, and obviously, that's something which we will have to be aware of. Um, we understand where limitations have been put on in other authorities. They haven't necessarily seen an increase in fly tipping, but it is, um, it is a risk of, of reducing <coughs> availability. Um, the increase in black bags, I I, yes, potentially, albeit we limit uh, households to how much residual waste they can put out in any event. Um, and whilst I would, I would hazard a view, and, and, and I'm sure any time will tell in relation to this, if indeed you go ahead with the closures, that people will become familiar with the closure patterns and, <coughs> and work accordingly. Um, so hopefully we wouldn't get a, a problem with either fly tipping or um, increase in, in black bag. It would be a particular concern, I'd have to say, if in, in fact our recycling figures dropped as a result as well. As would be in, um, the, uh, if, it, if indeed the black bags do increase and they're collected at the curbside, um, then it means less is going into the <coughs> civic community site. So... There is a limit on what they can do, to, but it is still residual. Our worry would be stuff going into residual, which ultimately could be recycled. That's the one which would, is of particular concern to ourselves. Um, pay on site and contact less. I, that's, a, that's a new one to me. I hadn't thought about that. Um, if it's universal, then um, I can see how it would work. I, I'm not sure about contact less, when or not it actually tells you where you come from. Is the issue about? Uh, could I come in on this? I said contactless for out of county residents. We would still have a permit scheme for those that live in the county. Okay, thanks. I thank you, Chair. Uh, there are, I know there are proposals to look at schemes around charging for out of county, and that may be one uh, which could be used. Um, but that I believe members would be wish to look at that in the future. Having, in, having implemented the proposals in here for officers to look at the feasibility of doing that. The fundamental benefit of the scheme is it, re, is it reduces the arisings because we're not taking people from across the borders. If you then wish to take those individuals, we can look at that in the future, as long as I, I would imagine members would want to ensure our self-financing, at which time quite possibly a contactless system may well be feasible. Yes, thank you very much. Thank um, you, if finally, I could... The, um, clip over the mirror, um, yes, possibly, that may well work. Um, and we can look at that when we actually look at the detail of the permit. I have a talk of why are we using permits and not just using utility bills or the like. We will accept them, but the fundamental about the permit is the operators on site can see it. If somebody has to check you've got a utility bill, you've got to have somebody receiving them. So if you're at Newport, which I've been to, there's a guy or gal there receiving it and saying, you will go there, there and there, use your bill. 
We don't have that. You have four sites with limited staffing on them, so they need to be able to see at a glance where or not that individual is actually entitled to be there. So as, you know, okay, people will forget and they'll say, oh, here's my utility bill, and yeah, that, that will work. But ideally, we want them to put that permit, and yeah, if they hang it over the mirror, even better. Thank you. If I can have the response from Councillor Murphy and then take questions from Councillor Jones and <coughs> Councillor Eason. I was just going to add, Chair, that I have been stressing at all of the budget meetings that the proposed charge into outside people is something for the uh, future. Uh, it is after we've uh, evaluated the eff effect of um, just dealing with, with Momisha people. So, um, you know, uh, you, useful points, but for uh, an another time. Thank you. Councillor Jones. I just wanted to add on permits. It's obviously been widely welcomed, the idea of it, and I completely agree with it. A visible um, sign is, is for those people who make life much easier, much quicker. Um, but um, the idea of putting it on to the end of or in with the council tax, I thought was a great idea to save money and sort of uh, getting it out and about to people in the county. Um, and then maybe you can add a perforated bit to hang it on whatever. We'll, we'll go into those future, uh, future details. But um, I'm just wondering what the time scale of that would be. That's, that was my question of sort of when were you thinking of implementing the in-county permit scheme? If you did it, thanks. I can't give you a timetable off top, off top. If indeed it does form part of your, your budget proposals, then I'll come back to, to members with, with the time scale for implementation. Um, in practice, it, 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 we, we already work with a company who provides us with our uh, garden waste tickets. Anybody who pays for the garden waste will know what I'm on about. So the, the technology is there for us, so it shouldn't be a, a massive task, he says, forever the optimist um, but I would have to come back to you to give you a bit more detail I wouldn't envisage it a, you know following the decision I can't imagine it's going to take a huge amount of time it won't be on the first I would be surprised if we can manage it by the first of April I'd have to say but um, I will provide you with a bit more information on that right thank you Councillor Rees and then Councillor Smith thank you chair why have we failed uh, not to be able to have collaborative working on, 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 some, on this matter, particularly on the five lane site where the boundary of Newport City is barely 50 metres from, from the actual entrance of the site, uh, which brings in places like Penhoe and Lanvakis who may want to come into this scheme. It seems to me that there's been a failure of collaboration. I see Councillor Murray got on a comment on that. Uh, yeah, um, Ray Mogford, the councillor in uh, Langston and uh, that area, has already uh, uh, been been on to discuss that. Um, he's, I know he's raised it in council this week uh, in Newport um, with a view to um, Newport um, actually paying us to take their uh, waste. Uh, how that works, I really don't know. But yes, it's been brought up and... Um, and uh, you know, watch this space, but uh, I don't know what the outcome of that is uh, going to be. But it's certainly been brought up um, recently. Because these pe these residents, they feel part of Caldecott and that area. They feel well, part they do, of it. they yeah, do. Yeah. But um, but it it it's outside. Um, if I was to uh, bet on uh, Newport putting their hands in their uh, pockets, I I I probably wouldn't want to. Councillor Smith. Very briefly, I don't know. If, I don't know if I told you, Robert Hoggins. Um, there's a new waste recycling operative opening up at Lower New Inn. You know the oh. old re the old rechem site, as we oh, used to yes. call it. Um, it's opening soon, apparently. So it might be interesting to know what they're doing. And I found it interesting actually because it's probably only half a mile from the Tor Fine Super Tip. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions on on waste and residence permits and sites? Did you uh, want to contribute at all, Councillor Jones? No. Um, and is there anything else you'd like to add, Councillor Murphy, before we wrap this? Well, thank you, members, for your questions. Uh, Councillor Eason. 
Thank you, Mr. Waste Chair. Um, it's, it's a question regarding the contracts we've got with other outside agencies where there's a possibility that we could lose a contract, which I think we've had about 10 years in terms of grounds maintenance, which puts our office and our staff under threat. Um, are we likely to lose that or maintain that contract? Are you referring to the housing, the grass cutting? Yeah. Um. Um, when, uh, I, I can't offer you an opinion as to whether or not um, we're likely to win or lose it. I can tell you that we put in an extremely um, comprehensive and I believe um, a good cost-effective bid. Um, it, however, it has to pay for the service. It cannot subsidise one against the other, and we would not wish to do so. We, we have had work for um, that housing association for over 10 years since they transferred out with a great deal of success. We've worked very well together over that period of time, um, but they did feel that they had to go out to the market, which they have done. Um, and we will advise members of the outcome um, as and when it's awarded. Uh, it, the bids are in at the moment. I'm not sure what the time scale is on award, but um, we remain, I remain quietly confident that we can retain it. But there is, we we know there's significant competition in that particular industry. So. Because there are seven direct posts involved if, if we lost a contract, and, and the contract they're looking to force you into or negotiate you into could lose two in any case. So I am concerned about levels of staffing. Um, thank you. And obviously, that's all the information we have at the moment, but we'll obviously be watching that very carefully. So unless there's any further questions, we'll move on to um, our next item. Uh, which and which is uh, item number six, revenue and cap capital monitoring 2018-19 outturn statement. And can I thank 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 you very much, Roger, for your attendance today. Th thank you. Yeah, she must be getting quite fed up with my voice this morning. I do apologise. Um, if it's okay with you, I'd like to double team this with uh, with Dave, my finance manager, that covers. Uh, Chief Execs and, uh, and the Central Services. Um, I'll, I'll give you a general perspective around the council position, and if you've got any specific queries around service uh, service matters, uh, we can direct them through uh, through Dave. So the report follows a. Oh, beg your pardon. <laughs> so the report follows a fairly common convention that cabinet receives uh, three times a year. Um, you as a select receive it largely to be able to uh, make a judgment around the, uh, the adequacy of the budget monitoring being undertaken by Cabinet and specifically any inquiries that you wish to make around uh, Strong Community Select portfolio. I provide it in two fashions for you, recognising that as, uh, as a general member you're, uh, you're more often than not expected to know about most things in the Council, um, but also that your role on this committee is quite precise. That's caused a couple of problems in the past there in terms of people's interest and appetite to understand things that don't necessarily sit on this committee. And I'm sure I must be a, uh, a bit of a pain in providing such a report to chairs management. So what we have tried to do uh, uh, over this last cycle is that where there are specific aspects that relate to the portfolio concern, we've tried to highlight them in a different text to able, that when you're reading it, to understand whether the, there's a general perception being provided to you or whether it's something that you could specifically be expected to, uh, to know about from your select portfolio, and hopefully that will be helpful. So as a general uh, guide, the month seven monitoring uh, predicts a forecast of £317,000 surplus. Uh, I'd be very pleased if that's the situation at the end of the financial year because increasingly it feels very uh, harder every year to get that side of the line. But I would put that in context that actually £317,000 surface is still only a less than a half of 1% variation against the overall budget, which even if it were a deficit position is an incredible close correlation to the overall budget. So table, table 3.1. Two shows you the 
3.6 surplus and where the uh, the volatility is and the necessary underspend in compensating for it. It'll be a bit strange for you to hear that an accountant thinks that the way that the budget is chunked up is quite an artificial construct because some things overspend and some things underspend. And actually through the year there, we try to operate the budget as holistically as possible, recognising that certain service areas may not be able to cut their cloth accordingly or provide a saving that they, uh, um, they'd they indicated to members through the saving process at the start of the year. And what we try to do is adjust those costs that we can do. So commonly you'll find that actually we use treasury financing, council tax levels, etc., as our main method of actually uh, mitigating any pressure on net cost of services. So paragraph 3.2.1 is specific to strong communities in explaining the, uh, the revenue monitoring outturn. Um, it's a net 81K underspend, but I won't... Uh, I won't steal Dave's thunder in explaining some of the pressures and, uh, and, and savings within that. Similarly, paragraph 3.55 shows the, the approval we had from members as part of the budget process last year in terms of where we were intent to make the savings and it indicates the progress made to date. Um, the shortfalls are generally around those areas which are of a, uh, a general nature in terms of not being allocated to one specific individual to follow through. So things like reductions in travel expenses or procurement savings more generally are those ones that we experience more of a problem in progressing. Um, and a lot of those ones before they actually get allocated specific service managers are facilitated through the future Monmouthshire arm. So actually there is a potential for strong communities to show that they're delivering less of the savings than is the reality because we often use them as the catch-all to actually facilitate a lot of those conversations. Capital in strong communities. Um, there is a a slippage proposed for this forthcoming year, largely around the work required to the J block and the car park to actually draw uh, draw staff back from the Mega offices to base them uh, to the building to the left of the entrance here. Uh, and also the community hub work. There's no, uh, th there's no sinister aspect to that. The tendering aspects are proceeding in terms of actually allocating that work and they will fall into, uh, into next year's capital programme and obviously we're, lo we're looking to move the resources between the two financial years to allow for that. Uh, 3.6.5 is quite interesting. I spoke earlier about getting extra capital from Welsh Government. This year we've received an extra £1.3 million worth of resourcing from them as extraordinary uh, uh, an amount as part of uh, a proposal to provide uh, local authorities with £50 million over a three-year basis. Um, the table in 3.65 indicates what we're actually proposing to use it for. Uh, you'll notice that £444,000 of which is to provide a direct benefit to the uh, to the revenue monitoring position uh, So it has provided an extra £150,000 worth of highways capital works and it has allowed for a, uh, some refinements to a, uh, a school classroom uh, matter uh, given the capacity and the school role uh, there. So it has been used in part for additional works but the main aspect is capitalising revenue expenditure to help with our overall revenue position. The remainder of that capital money Recognising we've got an overspend on our future schools tranche A is largely earmarked for that in the first instance. But obviously what we've tried to do in providing a, uh, a prudent forecast in relation to future schools, there's a potential for the situation to be better than we actually report. And if that's the case and it releases any extra monies, again, my first port of call would generally be to assist with, uh, with highways uh, maintenance work. But... For that to occur, I would need to get a view from full council anyway in terms of allocating it to specific schemes. And in that regard, whilst I've allowed for it in the monitoring, the monitoring is quite clear about still requiring full council's approval to actually make those capitalisations and that report will be going to the next, uh, the next meeting of full council. And then the last part of the, uh, the three cornerstones of finance is looking at reserves. And that starts in paragraph 3.8. Uh, 
Um, members may remember that we've set ourselves a financial planning target for our general council balance to be within four to six percent of net expenditure. If I look at the figures that are included in that table, we're just short of the 5% mark, which is where we probably should be in the, uh, in the current financial climate. If I do presume that the schools out to, of which is part of the council balance, if their deficit position is taken into account, that will take us just short of 4.5%. So you can appreciate why it's important for members to, uh, to be mindful of the school reserves position. And I would be keen to reassure you that that's at the forefront of CYP selects mind. And you'll be seeing from there what changes we've made to the, uh, um, the delegations to school to improve their monitoring, to actually get a better quality of information back on which to, uh, to form remedial action. And on that point, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much indeed for that uh, very comprehensive overview. Uh, members, who would like to ask questions on those aspects? Councillor Eason. Um, thank you, Chair. Street lighting comes under our portfolio, doesn't it? I'd like to ask a question about the street lighting uh, situation we're in at the moment. Going back some years, there were need to reduce the energy costs by changing lights, dropping them down. At the latest move is to go to LED lights. Um, yet we're still seeing in the projected portfolio an increase in or residual cost, sorry, not residual cost, continuing cost of maybe 72,000 pounds a year of energy costs. Uh, there are quotations elsewhere and other directorates that the energy costs will be expected to raise by 30% next year. Uh, others say 20%, but what, with the lighting scheme as we got at the moment, where they're off at midnight and on in the morning, there are a lot of concerns from a lot of residents about that particular policy. Is the policy working correctly at the moment? Are we on balance in terms of our lighting across the county with LED lights? And um, why are we expecting such an increase in energy costs? And equally, why, having gone down to LED lights, has that, not, has that cost not been reduced, yet it's still being shown as an increase? Is that too complicated? But I think the thing is, that's quite an operational question, really, and um, Roger's now gone, so um, I, I wouldn't expect... OK. I'll give it my best, Councillor. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we utilise a scheme offered by Welsh Government, whereby we uh, say... Members may know it as the SELEC scheme which allows us to do um, change lighting columns, put in the LEDs as you suggest. There is obviously a cost to that. The first port of call on any savings from ha having LED lights in there, which obviously have a lower uh, wattage than your traditional lights, is repaying that Salix loan. So just at the moment, we're not deriving the savings that you would longer term experience from moving a proportion of our lighting columns over to more energy efficiency works. I am able to, or pleased to report that actually, we're actually approaching Salex for the third of three tranches of money at the moment, which would get all of our, colleague, uh, our columns brought up to that new technological standard. The, re the reason why we're experiencing pressure around the utility side of it it's for the same reason that other departments are experiencing pressures, is that our annual contract with utility providers has an increase in cost to it, not a decrease in cost. They're arranged through the national procurement framework, and one of our considerations in terms of actually how we look at procurement going forward is whether the council might be better off outside of that arrangement, arranging its own contract, um, but we'd have to actually assess why it is that actually amalgamating all those contracts and having a better buying power hasn't necessarily resulted in a lower cost for all. So has the value of oil drop in and the value, sorry, the value of cost of oil drop in and the value of the pound since about, two, since about June 2016 dropped by maybe 12 or so percent, has that affected the overall cost of what we may need to pay and how in the future um, will that reflect on our finances if the, if, pound, if the pound drops further in percentage value and oil also drops. 
yeah, the, the the pound dropping is a uh, is a problem where you're importing, obviously, and a lot of these uh, arrangements, whether it be gas, oil, etc., are quite long term in nature by the uh, by, by the uh, the energy companies. You don't necessarily see short term gains and uh, and swings as a result of the wholesale price increases changing. In fact, a lot of off gems concerned recently in reported. Uh, uh, in the press is around these savings not being passed on to the consumer of which in this case the local authority would be regarded as a consumer they only ever seem to be going one way which is upwards so what would be the answer if we get a no deal i think if i could answer the uh, the question about no deal i probably wouldn't be working in a local authority i'd uh, you'd be seeing me on the six o'clock news there uh, describing the uh, the future for the council uh, um, it is a bit of an unknown. We do undertake energy efficiency initiatives, the LEDs for one. We have PV panels, we have our own solar, solar farm, etc. And actually one of the considerations for the future in mitigating some of those costs is whether to actually apply for generating station status and being a bit more self-efficient and using the energy that we create for the benefit of Monmouthshire rather than being at the... Uh, um, at the mercies of the prices that we're able to secure on our, our, on our energy. So this 30% projected increase this year, or some say 20, I think one of the officers says 30, why is it that high? Really, why is it that Because those are the figures that the utility companies have come back with in the, uh, in the framework contract as being the, uh, the cost for the, uh, the council's uh, energy. I, it's counterintuitive to me. I... I compare those costs to the costs that I pay as a householder. I can do things like uh, fix my costs. I can go from different providers to each other. I appreciate for a local authority it's a little bit different in terms of not having necessarily the, the, the wherewithal to do that. But those are the considerations in looking at the value of the MPS contract and whether there are things that we can do to mitigate that risk going forward. Thank you. Are there any other questions before we... Can I, can I just ask a question myself about um, reserves, really, and our ability as a council to cope now that our reserves, you say they're 5%, but obviously, you know, we're, we're in quite a difficult position if we were facing a real disaster scenario. And thinking back to, you know, the year 2001, when we had the foot and mouth disaster, um, was that, in that sort of scenario... Was that covered by central government or, you know, what would be the implications for us as a council if we had to face that sort of problem? And given that we've got Brexit and we have to really protect our rural community and our farms and, you know, this type of thing w would really be a, a disaster and we have to think of the worst case scenario. So how robust are we in our ability to deal with a, a problem like that? We're robust to the tune of about £7 million, which is our council fund uh, balance. Um, I'm struggling a bit to give you a commentary around the foot of mouth because I arrived in 2013 and I wouldn't know what the consequence to this council was, but I appreciate as a, as a rural authority it would be probably quite, uh, quite significant. But in relation to actually using this reserve and being prudent to, to set it aside to cover off for those eventualities... That's largely in the short term because I would imagine that actually Welsh Government assist longer term with something that carries on for, for, um, for, for a degree of time. So I would imagine that whilst local authorities will be expected to make any Brexit transition as smooth as possible from within their duties and responsibilities to support their... Uh, the businesses that operate in their section and, uh, and residents. We had a seminar recently within the, uh, within the council amongst uh, members that actually explained what the perceived risks are. And actually one of those is that actually from a financial planning term, there is no set aside budget yeah. to facilitate that. Um, some of that is around the fact that it's difficult to predict with any certainty what will happen as a consequence of Brexit or indeed whether it will actually occur. Um, and that's the purpose of having the council fund balance is to actually deal with 
these uncertainties. You would also be able to draw into a degree of your earmarked reserves as well, which provides you headroom up to the tune of about £14 million. But I do concede the, uh, the challenge, and it, it is a bit of an unknown for us all at the moment. Thank you very much. And I think that in context, I think Welsh Government set aside £150,000 to uh, you know, deal with Brexit throughout Wales, which seems a very small sum given the challenges that all local authorities are facing. Are, are there any other questions on, on this uh, aspect? And uh, no questions on the Chief Executive's unit. Is everybody quite happy? Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Yes? It's a point of clarification. Dave's reminded me that recently we've had confirmation of what the value of the energy contract will be, and it will be an uplift of 16%. So talk, talking of 20 to 30%, now hopefully I haven't left you uh, too, too gloomy going away from the meeting. No, it's just some officers' reports mentioned those figures. Um, can I thank officers that have attended today and I, th I think, you know, we've had an excellent debate on, on the budget. So thank you very much indeed. And um, we now move on to our agenda item seven. Thank you very much, Mark, which is to confirm the minutes of the previous meeting. Are these the minutes here? Previous meeting. They're in the book, they're ready to sign later. Okay, fine. So, are there any, any corrections or any issues that anybody would like to raise associated with the minutes of the previous meeting? No? Um, can I have somebody to propose, Councillor Webb and a seconder, Councillor Eason, all in favour? Thank you. Our action list, um, if you could just... Uh, Sorry, as I understand it, Chair, the actions have been um, dealt with. Um, okay. uh, Councillor Webb, then Councillor Jones. Can road safety strategy be included on that, please? Yeah, and Councillor Jones? Yeah, we, we discussed a litter strategy and working with schools and things, but it was litter and dog poo, from what I remember. Sorry if that could be added on. Um, and... and you said the action list has been done or whatever. I, have we had information on, on the updates then? Uh, I'm not sure much myself. Um, Hazel Isla would normally deal with this, but Hazel's not with us at the moment. So um, I, I can only assume that the actions have been, have been dealt with. If they have been completed, can we have some information on, on the outcomes, please? Thank you. Yes, and uh, you know, on this subject, um, obviously we're we're missing Hazel, and she's been unwell, and we, you know, really would like to extend our warmest wishes to her and hope that she has a recovery and that we see her back uh, shortly. So we are a little bit um, m missing, really, on our forward work program and our action list. We haven't got as much information as we normally do, but I'm sure that as soon as Hazel is back, that will be updated yeah so if we can now move on to is there anything else on the action list that anybody would like to suggest um strong community select committee forward work program obviously as i've just said we need more detail on that but um i just like to obviously um draw everybody's attention in a moment to our special meeting that we've got on February the 13th, which is a special um, meeting that's been arranged on around the toilet strategy. Thank you very much, Councillor Jones. It's the 13th, isn't it? Is it Wednesday the, thir Wednesday the 13th? Yes. Councillor Eason? Yeah, thank you. What, what is the, going to be the format of that meeting in terms of the toilet strategy? Because a colleague on the left here had done a big survey some 10 years ago. We're now left with very few we left with a few toilets within the council portfolio, a lot of them with community councils and other people. How are those two going to be brought together? Well, we've actually got a, a day out. Um, I've, we, I've, spent a, I've spent a weekend reading through all the previous information, which was extremely helpful from Councillor Webb. Um, obviously, there's a lot of work that was done there, but we are actually um, three of us 
um, Councillor Smith, Councillor Webb, myself and the manager who oversees the cleansing of all the MCC toilets. We are having a day out um, so that we can update ourselves and really be up to speed on the state of the toilets in the county. And obviously, um, the, the, the papers will be forwarded, but we've got that um, next week, isn't it? We're, we're out. Is it just the MCC toilets? Yeah. Yes, it is. But so, so as a county where we're... Sorry, Jeff, come on. I was just going to say that th this, is, this has come from Welsh Government and all councils have got to respond to this survey. Um, you can fill out the survey. I filled it out. Um, I, I think it's a Welsh Government one. I, I found it a bit um, laborious because you have to fill in things that don't apply to you. But I would encourage you to, to look at that and to respond to it. This area is one that, you know, is very emotive and something that is very important to our community. So it's only right that we give this the attention that it deserves. And we've been talking about our high streets and um, you know tourism and all these other aspects. And toilets is a very important aspect as far as that's concerned. Councillor um, Smith. I thought we would be taking in all the toilets that we know exist and that are actually run still by community or town councils to actually look at the condition of them because it's an, I don't think it's to me it won't be a complete review unless we do that I hate to tell you it's going to be a long day yeah sorry I didn't want to um to uh, mislead anybody and certainly in my own village of Gilwan, um, the community council have taken over the facility there and there certainly have been issues around it. So you're quite right, we're going to go to as many as we can, including those that have been adopted by town and community councils. And maybe at the same time, we can look at where there are provisions in, in other um, places like pubs and restaurants in towns and, you know, where people are actually going to use the facilities. So we will be covering all aspects, but I hope it's a meeting that we will be well attended because it is certainly something that our residents feel very strongly about. So uh, the council and cabinet, cabinet and council forward work programme, well, I think that needs to be as read. Is there any issues that anybody wants to raise on, on that forward programme? Does Mountain House come under our portfolio, but is a question of um, the, the future of Mountain House? I would have thought that would come under adults or children and young... DYP, but... It children isn't. and young people, I think that comes under there. But we'll, we'll check on that and uh, get back to you, Councillor Eason. Okay. That's an important point. Anything else from members? Okay, so we've got our special meeting on Wednesday the 13th of February at 10 o'clock and our next meeting of this committee will be on Thursday the 21st of March. Um, obviously both meetings is 9.30 for the um, pre-meeting and 10 o'clock for the meeting proper. But can I thank all members for their contributions today. I think it's been an excellent meeting and um, take care going home and uh, keep warm. And thank you also to our officers' support today. Thank you very much. The meeting's now closed.